at Serenian University of Technology, Thailand, and at Ho Chi Minh City Open University, Vietnam. Dr. Andrew Lin is Professor Emeritus at the University of Canberra, Australia. He is President of Acer Call, the Acer Association of Computer Assist Assistant Language um, sorry, Learning and a research and professional association focusing on the uses of technology enhanced to enhance second and foreign language learning in Asian context. And what is he sharing with us today? Well, Professor Andrew Lindis will talk about a relatively unnoticed aspects of technology in, in education. And these aspects may be unnoticed or hidden, but real and play a significant role in the development of the field. And he will discuss their impacts in the field of language learning. So welcome, Professor Andrew Lindis. Thank you very much. Um, president of Hassan University, um, President of Asia Call 2021-2, and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Fan Fu Fi Ho. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here, uh, both as a speaker, but also as a uh, president of, uh, of Asia Call. I will spend some time later uh, ex uh, extending my thanks to the university, but I wanted to say before uh, I do anything else, I wanted to say how grateful I am to the university for extending its magnificent facilities to us, and we have seen their facilities in the uh, video at the beginning of the uh, communication. And also to um, Dr. Wu, who has been uh, yes, instrumental in making uh, this happen. I'm not going to spend more time thanking people because all of my time will disappear in doing that. But uh, Dr. Tweedy, thank you so much. Um, I, 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 from the depths of my heart personally and from that of Asia Call, thank you. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity and we love the fact that this is actually the second Asia Call conference in 2021, believe it or not. And I also find it very interesting that we have had 50% more uh, abstract offers for the second uh, for the second conference than for the first conference. So I think, I think all in all, Everything is looking really, really good. Thank you all very much again. So let me, let me begin. I need to see the little cross somewhere which says that I can show you my, my, uh, do I? How can I share my PowerPoint? I don't think I'm allowed to share. Dr. Wu, just a minute. Professor. Okay. Ah, I see the cross. Okay, I will. What am I sharing? I'm managing a presentation, right? No, I'm not managing a presentation. So at the left hand side corner, you see that a big plus. And click yes, there. I've seen the I've seen the big plus. I've seen the big plus. Mm -hmm. We have the button for sharing screen on the right. At the bottom, I mean.
Okay, this is a miracle of... <laughs> of uh... Okay, yes, I'm seeing, I'm sharing my... I'm about to share my screen, there we go. But, uh, but, uh, not just to this big blue button. Good. It's on. It's on now. I can see that, I can see that, yes. I need to look at that. And I need to <coughs> go to here. Okay, so let me do the usual check. I, I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see the screen. Yeah, very loud and clear. Okay, so very loud, loud. okay. <laughs> Maybe I should reduce my volume. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. This is a, a kind of a, trying to set the scene for some of the things we normally talk about at conferences such as this. I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about what I see as hidden impacts of technology and language learning and a little bit about stereotypes. <clears throat> so let me make an introductory comment. This is, first of all, it is a short reflective piece. It's not, I'm not going to talk to you about the wonders of technology and what it's going to be able to do. I am, however, going to talk to you about the connection between technology and language learning theory and practice, at least in the first part. And in the second part, I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> so one of the stereotypes of technology and language learning, which is, I think, a little bit problematic. I've entitled the first part of this presentation, Hidden Impacts of Technology in Language Learning, because it will not be the typical presentation. Okay, and I've said this before. <clears throat> So let me begin. So typically when we think of developments in language learning, we have a tendency to think that they emerge from research and that it is research that guides the process or, and the progress as well. Now in doing so, we sometimes forget that researchers themselves are people and that they are embedded in the community in which they live and not only in their community of practice, which is I don't know what it is anymore. In the olden days, we used to know what uh, uh, an applied linguist was or what a, 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 a language educator was and so on. Now it's getting much more vague. And I'll talk about this for a few minutes. So here's the issue. I will argue that the developments which have occurred are just as much, if not more, a reflection of social expectancies as they are of theoretical developments in the fields of linguistics, applied linguistics, and pedagogy. And I will also argue that these expectancies apply both implicit and explicit pressure to research to develop along certain lines. Now, I'm not going to have time to deal with this in a lot of detail, but I think you get the picture. In other words, the culture in which researchers are embedded and it's accompanying collective unconscious. I want to you to think a little bit about the, the, the notion of collective unconscious. The stuff that we all share unconsciously and which actually we tend to believe in in some way. And that will guide the way that researchers think and dictate, at least to some extent, the shape of the research in the field. So I'll start off with a little story. The little stories I have just finished teaching a PhD course in uh, Sranari University of Technology. I taught something similar at uh, uh, the Open University a couple of years ago. And this, this is called Trends and Issues in English Language Studies. Now, in this course, students were meant to identify and critique the various trends and issues that were influencing, apparently, the field of English Language Studies. In other words, what's going on in the field? And, you know, I'd be interested to find out what you think is going on in the field. Because it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. So, it's not surprising to hear that the very first trend that my students identified was that there was a trend toward technology. Right? So, everybody thinks technology is there and everybody thinks we're using it. And the answer is both yes and no. Now, having said that, the primary emphasis on technology identified was in areas such as, of course, e-learning, 
biotechnology, artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, augmented reality, virtual reality, big data, and so on. This is just a short list of what the students felt was going to be a trend, and it's not quite a trend yet. Of course, all of these are very important. Yet, while they are extremely important, it seems to me that this is not what the ultimate impact of technology is all about. Now, they also identified other trends. We'll come back to that question. Including, um, other trends included collaborative learning. They included, of course, these, the popular things like translanguaging and English as a lingua franca together with blended learning and flipped learning, which are everywhere, and we can argue about what they mean. I think they mean less than people want it to mean, um, but anyway. And then while all of these trends can be seen as emanating from research and language education, this is not the only place where they exist. In fact, the trends are ubiquitous in society in general and are ingrained in the culture as a result of the impact of technology. In other words, technology is doing things to people which is not necessarily explicit and not necessarily desired. Maybe desirable, but it's not necessarily desired. So, in a nutshell, developments in language education today uh, are not only the result of research in language teaching and learning, but also comes from out of the fact that society expects research to produce these kinds of structures. And that's kind of interesting because we don't normally think of society as expecting anything from research, uh, explicitly at least. But it seems to be the case that it is doing so, at least in our case. It's a kind of national development of views and practices held in the collective unconscious of societies with, with access to modern technology. So if, if people have modern technology, this looks as though it's kind of naturally developing in their minds. All of the language learning trends listed are actually expected by the modern citizen and are predictable from our current situation. And there are, of course, other forms of prediction which are possible, and I'm reminded of people like Yuval Harari uh, in, in Israel, and his, uh, and his colleague Daniel Kahneman, who are talking about predictions where technology will replace people, where technology will create a class of useless people or redundant people, uh, and so on. And, and then, but, but that's a different issue. So that, anyway, let me try to explain. In a study that I performed in 2011, and still relevant today, I identified eight features of educational life in the 21st century that are relevant to this conversation. They are largely technology-based and may actually be responsible for much of the modern mindset. And I'll list them briefly, but I'll refer to only a few. They are, first of all, an unprecedented rate of change. Everything is changing very, very fast all the time. Secondly, an unprecedented richness of information. We have more access to more information, of more diverse information, of different kinds, of unexpected kinds, of mainstream information, of outlier information. All of these things add to the richness and diversity of the information which is there. Thirdly, we're starting to understand, and partly because of technology, but and also partly for theoretical reasons, I said I wouldn't talk about all of these. The universe is interdisciplinary in nature. There is no such thing as a discipline of coal. There is no such thing as a discipline of TESOL. There is no such thing as a discipline of foreign language teaching. There are many disciplines which together combine to form these, let's call them sub-disciplines. Fourthly, the central importance of research for all. We are, believe it or not, we are turning into researchers. Fifthly, uh, knowledge 
uh, perception and meaning-making theories are going to become important because how we see the world really matters. Number six is the power of social networking. Well, we know how powerful social networking is. We've seen what happened in the Egyptian revolution in 2011 when it was instrumental in overthrowing governments. And communications, of course, is the first thing that people who want to take over power will attack. We need creativity and divergent thinking in this context. And that's something that... I will not talk about, but I, I, I do sometimes talk about, and I think it's extraordinarily important. And all of this results in the students having more power. And we'll see how that, we'll, we'll, we won't see today, but, but that can take many shapes. So let's look briefly at a couple of these things. The first one is an unprecedented rate of change, and clearly this is due to technology. This change has placed a great deal of pressure on humanity to change also, and change quickly. If you look at the curve, and I didn't bring, I, I've got it in the PowerPoint, but I didn't want to show it because I showed it last time we talked. The curve for the development of technology is very much exponential, it's like a hockey stick. And um, the changes that are happening are, are happening very fast. This is putting pressure on humanity to change quickly. Not everyone has been successful at changing quickly. But I know one thing. Humans are really good at adapting and they will deal with the changes successfully in the long term. So we have now entered a change mindset. We are in a mindset of change. Nothing is stable. Nothing lasts long especially technical information. So in the mind of many, there is no point in learning stuff that will be out of date soon. And that, to some extent, I think, um, explains part of the crisis in the university system, at least in the United States. What's the point of learning anything if it's going to change? The problem is to know what is the thing that is going to change and how do you deal with it. But if things are going to change all the time, well, just look it up when you need it. It's called the Google effect. The Google effect is an effect which uh, afflicts people who do not want to remember things or who say, that, what's the point of remembering? When, when I need something, something, I'll go and find the latest version of it. And it works. But of course, people in university systems, not everybody in university systems, but some people in the university system get annoyed with that because they think it undermines their knowledge. Actually, it doesn't. Because there is still what we might call fundamental knowledge, essential knowledge, things you have to know and to understand before you can forget things. Now, we tend to use what's called a just-in-time, just-enough and just-for-me approach to knowledge and, and information gathering. What does that mean? Well, when I need something, I go and look for it. When I find the something, I don't need to know everything about the field, just what will help me to deal with my problem today. And it is just for me, because that information applies only to my context. So this is the approach I've been describing, and it contrasts with a just-in-case approach, where we have to learn lots of potentially useless things just in case we need them one day. As an example, how many of you remember, like it's a pity, we, we, it's not a real interaction, but anyway. Um, how, many, how many of you remember how to solve a quadratic equation? Where the quadratic equation is of the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Does anybody know? Anyone want to try? 
Have, have you ever used, used that? that? Mm. Maybe, Maybe not. not. Maybe, Maybe you have. have. I don't know. I know, I know the, the answer, answer because for some reason I remembered it. But, but actually, I don't think I've ever used it for anything. So what, as a result of that, we are becoming more focused, more selective in what we invest our time and energy. We choose more carefully about how we're going to spend our time. Now, when we look at the unprecedented richness of information, well, while we're becoming more selective in our point of focus and interest, we also have much more than ever before to choose from. We go to Google, we write, I don't know, language learning, and we have three million answers. Good luck in finding something that you think is okay. And the, pro the point, of course, is that we, uh, our eyes and our brain tend to focus on what's called the golden triangle. The golden triangle has nothing to do with drugs. It's a triangle which looks at a page of text and looks in a triangular way from the top left to the top right down to the bottom left. That's all we look at. And things, maybe, that someone else chose for us. That's it. Information is proliferating at an exponential rate, in fact, at an outrageous rate. And much of it is becoming outdated very fast. This means that information is unstable and we need to become more selective, more critical in deciding what is valuable and what is not. That's where think places like universities and so on are critically important because they teach us how to be critical, how to think differently, how to think well. The proliferation of information, however, <coughs> sorry, has weakened the position of the subject matter expert and turns us all into experts. So let's say I'm giving a lecture somewhere and I say something, my students who have laptops in front of them immediately go to them and start asking questions like, he says this, is it right? And so on. And so you have a battle of Let's, let's call it human, human experts, experts against Google. Google. Well, well, actually, experts, of course, still exist. exist. But, but ordinary humans also feel much more in control, control of knowledge than before, and we also, also have more access to it. So when, when we continue looking at the unprecedented richness of information, what's, what's happening? happening? Well, well this, this results in the democratization of knowledge and emancipation, at least in principle, and in part, from the various social structures, including educational structures, which govern our lives. Democratization of knowledge and emancipation. Those of you who uh, uh, studied the Reformation in Europe will remember that when the printing press appeared, people started to read the Bible for themselves and started to complain that the way the church had been, the Catholic church had been interpreting the, church, the, the Bible was incorrect. And as a result of that, the Protestant movement uh, came to be. But what's interesting here is that we are becoming more independent educationally as well as socially. And we are turning into researchers, <coughs> and this is a very, I think this is a very important point, we are turning into researchers by virtue of the fact that we no longer depend on the knowledge of others to succeed in our objectives. Okay? Your printer is broken. What do you do? You go to YouTube. YouTube will help you. You've done a little bit of research. You've made a decision. All, all the time we have to make decisions. This is good. This is bad. This is not so good. This is appropriate. This is not appropriate. That's what research is. But, but we're still doing, doing research, research as ordinary humans. This is called freedom. freedom. I want to make it clear. We have more freedom than before. A 
of the language of trends on language teaching, teaching and learning. learning. Freedom, Freedom is another word for autonomy, autonomy and it's built in, in to the, the technological, technological structures that we live in. Those, those who have access to information, to information now have an autonomous, an autonomous mindset. mindset. And that's, that's an important, important discovery, discovery, not an important discovery, an important realization. realization. If, if we, we have, have a problem, we solve it ourselves. ourselves. We, we have a do-it-yourself do mentality. But do-it-yourself, if you use the term do-it-yourself as I have in the past, it hides the notion of autonomy, which is actually more important. But actually, if you like, it is not just autonomy, but it is autonomy in action. And, and not, not just for a few, but, but for everybody. everybody. Well, well, not, not everybody, everybody, of course, <laughs> those who have access to the technology. technology. Now, now, connected with this, an automatic, automatic but critically important side effect of autonomy is personalization. Why, Why is that? that? Well, well, because, because people, people are free to choose whatever, whatever they're interested in, whenever, whenever they are interested in it, and, and the information is necessarily tailored to their perceptions of their needs. So we now have a society that is becoming more autonomous and more personalized. Now, having said that, it's also true that commercial organizations are using this development to exploit people. But this is called personalization. Autonomy and personalization go hand, hand in hand. hand. Blended learning, learning at its best, at its best, its best is personalized because it has a significant, significant component of autonomy. autonomy. Thirdly, it's, it's a needs-based needs approach. Another, Another automatic, automatic but critically important. important. I, want to, I, want to I want to emphasize the fact that these things happen automatically. automatically. No, 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 no one, one has gone around saying, oh, we have, we have to do it this way, we have to do it that way. Another, Another automatic, automatic, automatic but critically important side effect is that people are becoming more reactive, reactive to their personal needs and are therefore now operating in what we might call a needs-based approach to the solution of their problems. And this is consistent with modern educational approaches. In other words, people have given themselves the power of education in their lives. They can often decide what, when, where, how, and for how long they wish to study. They, they do not, not get, get a degree for it, for it. They, they don't get a certificate, certificate for it, but they, they do get, get what they need. And in many ways, they are masters of their own destiny. destiny. And, and this, this is really, really quite visible in the, in the proliferation, proliferation of MOOCs, MOOCs massive, massive open online courses, courses where, where the completion rate, rate where hundreds of thousands of people enroll, and the completion rate is very small. small. Uh, one figure I heard just recently is about 3%. And coupled with that is the growth of nano-learning, which reflects both interest in education and the presentation and reinforcement of learning in small, bite-sized, manageable pieces. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it is consistent with the just-in-time, just-enough and just-for-me criteria of need and learning. Of course, of course, social, social networking, networking plays an important role, role when we combine these developments with this huge growth of connectivity between people. We now, now find ourselves caught in a galloping development, which is kind of out of control. Now everybody knows everything about everybody else. I know what all my colleagues have for breakfast, for example. I know when they're going to leave their house, so if I want to go and steal something, I can do that. Of course, it won't, but I'm saying that this is, it's, life has become very public and life has become very connected. And people kind of like, there's a kind of um, narcissistic approach to life. However, in this context of, of social connection, collaboration is crucial for many reasons including critically the possibility of being exposed to new and unusual ideas and new and unusual ideas of outliers. Outliers are people who are not in the mainstream, people who are different, people who are not necessarily loved by the mainstream. But they have a voice now which they never had before. 
at the same time, looking at the social aspects of the intellectual aspects, we have seen stunning examples of intellectual crowdsourcing, such as the Folded Initiative. The Folded Initiative, I'm sure you know, it was, a, was a, an initiative where scientists have been trying to work a problem called protein folding of a particular protein in their uh, uh, research on AIDS. Then 10 years trying to do it, they couldn't do it. They invented a game, they put it online, 200,000 people participated. In two weeks, the, pro the problem was solved. And it was not a bunch necessarily of specialists who solved it. It was a combination of scientists, non-scientists, ordinary people, and so on. Just goes to show how powerful crowdsourcing can be, how powerful bringing people together can be. And I think that's led to what I call the growth of community intelligence, community intelligence being the thing which um, enables groups to think together and grow together intelligently. Now, remember too that most often progress comes from the contributions of groups. Groups. Groups are people who get together and work on similar things and put their brains together. Working in isolation is not necessarily always a good thing. And I've got this funny thing on the side which says font, F-O-N-P-H. Now I'm sure you remember Michael Long's font, F-O-N-S, focus on form, and then focus fonts, F-O-N-F-S, which is focus on forms. Well, this is font, and it stands for focus on the physical. And focus on the physical is actually a, 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 some research that I'm doing with a team of people on how to change the physical nature of the auditory signal in order to help people learn foreign languages better. And we just completed a pretty big study in China on uh, using encephalograms and event-related potentials and fMRIs, I'm sure you've heard of fMRIs, which is functional magnetic resonance imagery, which looks at the way the blood flows through the brain at different times. So working in groups will help us also to reduce stagnation and to move forward. I wanted to say a couple of things. One is that is what I call the resilience of dogma. Dogma is what we all are taught as a matter of fact in our courses. It, dogma is very strong and very powerful. And despite all that I have said, the power and embeddedness of conservative forces, the dogma of the few cannot be discounted. You want to make a change to the syllabus. It is not easy because somebody will quote an authority that may be out of date, but nevertheless an authority to maintain the current situation. Make no mistake, I've been talking about change, but the fear of change is deeply anchored in the human psyche and is always greeted with suspicion, often in the guise of caution. People will not say, oh, I'm suspicious of you, no, I'm being careful, rather than embraced with hope. What is significant in that statement for our conversation today is the fact that the changes which are happening in society are not imposed by anybody. They happen, they happen, people will say, unconsciously. It's a bit like language change. People say, except for enforced language change, that language changes only when the group makes it change. Thus, all of the foundations, what's interesting now is that all of the foundations for our modern educational language systems and our research are actually embedded but hidden in modern society and possibly even find their source in it. It's kind of strange. Society, therefore, 
expects these things to happen. They don't say, oh, I expect you to personalize it, but they expect it in their unconscious minds. It requires them to happen. And, as a, and we find, and by the way, we notice that this is true when things go wrong and they don't get what they want and then they start saying, but you should be doing it this way, you should be doing it. <coughs> so society expects these things to happen. It requires them to happen. And as a consequence, society itself acts as a catalyst for change. And they say, no, 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 society doesn't act for change. Well, it does. But it does so unwittingly, and sometimes it does so badly. And in a sense, we now find ourselves engaged in a battle between unconscious society-based approaches to learning and education on the one hand, and more conservative, dogmatic approaches often based on outdated research of the past. That's for part one, I'll we'll set that part there. Part two, I'll talk very briefly about this, brings me to the end of the first and major part of the presentation. I want to talk a little bit about an issue, a separate issue, which has been bothering me for some time, but I thought I'd talk to you about this as President of Asia Corp. And that is a stereotype of technology-enhanced language learning that is prevalent in the educational communities that we function in. And this became glaringly obvious in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here's what happened. Suddenly, with no significant notice, schools, universities had to go online. And they had usually very little preparation and support. They didn't have the benefit, for example, of having Dr. Vu or Dr. Ho uh, in their staff. Individual teachers were suddenly required to become experts in e-learning, and of course many did not do this very well. However, many did do well, and schools and universities and other educational organizations realized that online activities could be okay, maybe even better. Yet in the midst of this potential success, teachers are faced with the reality. This is the point I want to make. Teachers, teachers are faced with the reality that they are more or less alone in having to grapple with the challenges of technology and enhanced language learning. And when I say alone, I mean they are literally alone or they have one or two friends, but there is no significant support around them. Also, they, um, this remains somehow invisible embedded in the culture of what it means to be a teacher. Teachers are told, you are in charge, it's your responsibility, you've got to fix it, go ahead and do it. Except when they're told to do something specific like teach online. And even when they are, they are often told, well, find a way. And I know many, many instances where this has happened. The teachers have been raised to be self-reliant. They are told that they are in charge of their classes and their destinies. But actually teachers cannot do everything and they are not all powerful. Nobody is. We are all limited in some way. So we need to get away from the image of the brave teacher, selflessly facing the challenges of the profession alone, or with a couple of colleagues to support them. And the COVID crisis has generated countless good examples of technology-enhanced language learning, yet they remain hidden, invisible, and beyond our reach. We did not do in our field what the Foldit team managed to do. We have not crowdsourced online language education, nor have we convinced public funding to invest in it. We still have no international TEL centers. We still, we still have, have no consortia delivering tail education and training. training. Well, well, we do, do have some, but they are pretty much voluntary. voluntary. In, In fact, fact, paradoxically, and this is interesting, the number of formal programs, programs in technology-enhanced language, language learning around the world seems to be going down rather than increasing. I started maybe the first language, uh, computer-assisted language learning training program in the world, world definitely in Australia, in, in 1988. 1988. And we, we thought there would be a development. development. No, no, it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Why didn't it happen? Well, well, one of the reasons is you don't need 
you know, 10 million specialists in technology enhanced language learning. But there, but there are, are ways of bringing people together and making the program viable. viable. Yet, Yet we're not alone. alone. That's, That's right, we're not alone. We, are, we, are, we are actually are all in this together. together. And, when and when I say, I say we, I mean we at Asia Call today, today uh, and, and we in the world, world generally. generally. But, but for those, those of us who are here today and who are interested in Asia Call and who have demonstrated their commitment to Asia Call by the number of papers you've submitted and by your presence online, I really urge you to get together with like-minded people to try and reduce the loneliness, to try and reduce the fatigue. People get tired. To share knowledge, ideas, research, and most of all, enthusiasm to the benefit of everybody here. So this brings me to an end, uh, the end of my second point for today. Let me conclude. Both, Both points that I have made are related, and we have all of the tools for success. Society is ready for progress in technology-related language education. It already contains the seeds for that success, and in many ways is ahead of the research. It is already telling researchers what matters and what does not matter, and we are actually seeing developments in research which are mirroring developments in society. And research needs, researchers need to understand that and to be humble about it, and they also need to understand that they too are part of the society, they're part of the social developments that are occurring, and that these things will inevitably impact on our learning and teaching practices. So we now face an interesting challenge. It will not be a smooth ride, but groups such as Asia Corps offer hope for the future, not necessarily only through the organization itself, but through its ability to bring together people of goodwill. And we do this quite nicely. We call it the Asia Corps family. And yes, this is a call to action, in case you're wondering. It is a call to action. We need to do something. The first time I issued the call to action was a long time ago in Korea. Um, when I suggested an international computer-assisted language learning center. Thank you very much. I will stop now. And please feel free to contact me. Thank you. I'll stop. You are now unmuted. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, Professor Antolin, for celebrating your findings and insights.